Hello, everyone, and welcome to the International Interprofessional Mentorship Meeting. I am Dr. Kate Barlow, the founder and host for today's meeting. It's January 12th, 2022. And today, two of our members of our group are going to be presenting. Victor Elokai and Mickey Barron are here to discuss OT's role in refugee camps. Please mute yourselves during the presentation, and then you can unmute yourself anytime if you have a question, or you can type your question into the chat box, and I will interrupt the presenters to ask the question for you. Um, in order to receive a certificate of attendance, please enter your name and email into the chat box now, and you will need to remain on the webinar until it is finished. And at the conclusion of the presentation, if you'd like to stay on, we have a volunteer optional meet and greet where we say hello to everyone. So thank you um, for coming and Victor, you can get us started. Thank you. Oh yeah, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kate. Uh, good evening members and good afternoon, uh, depending on where you're coming from. I'm Victor Alochi from Uganda, an occupational therapist. Um, with uh, working experience in different fields, uh, qualified in 2016, but since then I've ventured into different fields in occupational therapy, inclusive of uh, substance use disorder, uh, cerebral palsy, refugee camps, and uh, host communities. And uh, right now I'm doing more of uh, uh, community occupational therapy, and uh, I'm glad to be here and uh, be one of the presenters of today. Um, I'm, I'm talk, going to talk on uh, uh, two uh, locations, that is the refugee camps and also uh, the host community. Uh, briefly, uh, in the host community, uh, we are looking at uh, people who have uh, come from the refugee camps and joined uh, the community uh, because uh, right now uh, people um, those who have been longer uh, being uh, uh, taken back to their or have been gotten chance to go back to their respective countries uh, they are also getting included into the community and uh, they are getting citizenship and uh, joining the community and participating just uh, like uh, any other person, but among those people with disability and ones we are trying to work with, both refugee, but also those ones who are not refugee, depending on the criteria that I will be talking about shortly. Uh, uh, when we talk about refugees in Uganda, as of October 2021, we had a total of 1,549,181 refugees in Uganda. And uh, by the time borders remained closed for incoming refugees, but certain categories of rich refugees are allowed to enter on a case by case basis. And uh, but still, you'll find that many of them do enter illegally. So uh, the number of refugees, in other words, do go up each and every day. So we have uh, a criteria in the disability inclusive. Uh, projects that we are implementing among the refugees and also the host community. Uh, we are looking at uh, the ultra poor among these. Uh, so for a, a host community person to qualify for this uh, uh, program person must be uh, an ultra poor person. But uh, for a person who is a refugee to qualify uh, for our program, the person has to be uh, uh, a person with a disability. And when we talk about uh, the ultra poor uh, in Uganda, the profile is uh, someone having irregular income or no income sources. Uh, the person has limited or productive assets, or sorry, or no productive assets. Uh, the person has food insecurity and uh, there is uh, cases of money. Hey, Victor, you broke up for a second. We can't hear you.
Well, you know, we did a practice run through yesterday and we had absolutely no connectivity problems. And of course, today we have problems, but that is the, the, uh, the deal with technology. Of course, it's the way it works. I mean, we do have a lot of countries <laughs> on here right now, but poor Victor. Victor, can you hear us? Do you want to send us a note in the chat? Okay, so he must have. Um, I don't know if you can see my screen. Yeah, we can see it. And thank you again for changing things up. <laughs> Yeah, sure, sure. So I can just start? Yeah, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, greetings. My name is Mickey Baron. I'm an occupational therapist currently based at Kenyatta National Hospital, which is the biggest referral hospital in uh, Eastern, Central and uh, Sub-Saharan region. And uh, I'm in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, well, uh, I graduated in 2019. So basically I have like two years of experience, uh, but I've worked in various places. I've worked in a uh, community-based rehabilitation sector. I've worked in the slums. I've worked in a clinical setup and i've also worked in a school setup as an occupational therapist and uh, i worked in a refugee camp that is kakuma refugee camp which is one of the largest uh, refugee camps in the whole world so i'll just go ahead uh, with the presentation so basically today uh, we're going to talk about occupational therapy in inclusive education now, that is in Kakuma refugee camp. My main aim is to just share my experience uh, on how I handled things over there, how I interacted with the refugees, and basically spearhead or highlight um, some of the roles of occupational therapists in the refugee camp that is in Kakuma refugee camp. So um, we all talking about Kakuma refugee camp, and I felt like I really needed to talk about it, where it is located, because we are from different parts of the world. Um, so Kakuma refugee camp and Kalobei integrated uh, settlement, and uh, Kakuma is uh, located in the northwestern region of Kenya. Uh, the camp was established in 1992, following the arrivals of, you know, lost boys of, of Sudan. And during that year, large groups of Ethiopian refugees fled from their countries uh, because there were some wars in their countries. And also in Somalia, they also experienced some wars. So this one led to the refugees to flee into Kenya, that is into Kakuma refugee camp. And in Kakuma refugee camp, we, we have UNSCR, which basically is like a mother, mother of all organizations um, in that camp. And uh, they have divided uh, Kakuma refugee camp and Kalobei in uh, different sections. And uh, we have Kakuma one, Kakuma 2, Kakuma 3, and Kakuma 4. Well, in Kalobei settlement, it has like three villages. There is village 1, village 2, and village 3. So Kakuma and Kalobei integrated settlement, it had a population of 196,666. Uh, that is the end of July in 2020. And in 2014, uh, there was some influx of new arrivals. 
uh, which suppressed the, uh, the capacity of the number of refugees in the camp over 58,000, uh, which led to a congestion. No? And then UNHCR and the national government of Kenya with the county government of Turkana and the locals, uh, the host community that is, they came together and decided to designate uh, a certain piece of land, which was 20 kilometers away from Kakuma town, and they named it Kalobei Settlement. So basically I'm trying to make you understand the area, the, geog the geographical aspect of things over there. And um, we had core values that uh, were guiding us in terms of delivering of our services in the organization that I was working in, that was Jesuit uh, uh, Refugee Service, GRS. And it's a Catholic organization, a Christian organization. And so we had these fundamental core values that uh, were guiding us in our practice. That is compassion, uh, we had hope. We had to instill hope to the refugee, to the refugees who were in the camp. We had dignity. We had solidarity. We had to stand with the refugees because uh, they have passed through a lot. Huh? And we had hospitality and justice also, and also participation because they all have the rights of participating in day-to-day uh, -day, uh, live encounters. So these are some of the core values that were guiding us in terms of service delivery across uh, Kakuma Refugee Camp and Kalobei. So we were talking about inclusive education and uh, generally the project uh, had covered like two temporarily uh, protection houses for survivors of sexual and gender-based violence and children with protection needs or rather children living with disability and we had of we we offered a comprehensive case management uh intertwined with psychosocial support and skill training so these services helps uh, achieve stability and develop skills necessarily to transition to a more suitable situation McHugh, uh, these people have fled from their countries and they're in a new place. So basically we really wanted to make them more comfortable in their new environment. So talking about education, uh, so according to UNESCO, in terms of de defining inclusive education, uh, they stipulated that uh, it's a process of addressing and responding to the diversity needs of all learners through inclusive practice, practices rather in learning, cultural and communities, and reducing exclusion within and from and from education. No? And uh, the rights to education does not cease to exist when a child moves or, free, or flee from their country. So there are these guidelines that really uh, protect uh, the rights of individuals who basically are fleed from their countries or who are refugees and they have rights to education. No? So um, be it if there are uh, few resources or systems that are in refugee camps or in formal settlements or temporarily living places. So when children have flee across borders and find themselves in a new country, their right to education is protected by a legal framework, uh, the 1951 Refugee Convention, and they are formed by multilateral commitments such as the 2016 Comprehensive uh, Refugee Response Framework. So basically these are just uh, tender laws uh, laid down to like protect the rights of refugees to find a suitable or to find uh, education. So I'd talked about the project and uh, 
our project uh, had targeted a total number of 300 beneficiaries across uh, the five centers and in the community. So beneficiaries, these are typically refugees who would benefit from our services, be it occupational therapy services, counseling services, psychosocial support services, all that. So we had a total number of 300 beneficiaries with special needs, different special needs, be it the ones that are visible or the ones that are not visible. So activities that are taking place in these projects, uh, we had rehabilitation support for children with disability in inclusive education, that is uh, occupational therapy services, physiotherapy services, uh, speech and language services, psychosocial support services. Were, they were intertwined together to just help a refugee to you know, come back to, to a normal life. So specifically, we're aiming at reinforcing the interventions uh, to children with intellectual and multiple disabilities in Kakuma and Kalobei camps. So our main aim were intellectual and multiple disabilities, be it physical disability, be it intellectual, be it vis if it is visible or not visible. So the occupational therapist over there uh, will lead the process in terms of development, implementation and coordination of the occupational therapist at the five inclusive education centers and in the community. So, uh, as I said, we have five, co five centers across uh, Kakuma refugee camp. So, when I was there, I was the only occupational therapist. So, I had like uh, inclusive OTs, uh, incentive OTs rather, I had like incentive OTs. These are, uh, these are uh, refugees who have been given basic skills on occupational therapy so that at least they can reach out to, to the community because basically uh, I, I could not reach out to the entire camp. So I had to like train incentive occupational therapists and also incentive special need teachers in terms of uh, handling uh, these cases. So um, the OT, one of the roles of OTs is we, I, I used to like screen and assess our patients or our beneficiaries rather, used to evaluate them and then make proper referrals. Like we had these chains of referrals. If I had a case, I would refer to, to another organization if it is a Lutheran World Federation for in terms of school placement for these kids because one of the roles of an OT over there was to be able to transition the child from, from one school to the, main school to the mainstream schools, that is the LWF or rather Lutheran World Federation. Or we will also last with humanity and inclusion in terms of providing assistive devices for these uh, benefic beneficiaries of ours in our various centers and uh, we'll give an educational program and transitioning planning. Uh, we'll also offer therapeutic intervention and discharge planning for learners identified uh, or suspected of having disabilities that interfered with their ability to perform their live activities or participate in necessary or desired occupation. So basically that is some few roles of, of an OT over there in the, in, in the camps because we are basically concentrating on the education aspect of things. So I hope everyone can see the image uh, that is on the screen. Thank you, Dr. Kate. And uh, I felt like uh, I will really show you what it is like over there in Kakuma refugee camp, how it is. And uh, this is just a typical classroom in one of our centers across Kakuma and Kalobei uh, camps. And uh, I just show using my arrow. Uh, he is an incentive special need teacher, meaning he is a refugee camp. 
is a, uh, is a South Sudanese who has been trained on basic special need uh, skills in terms of handling kids with uh, you know different needs. And these are our beneficiaries. And uh, over here, uh, I've done a lot of adaptation of these kids in terms of uh, the level of the, of the of the table. And then they were doing work together in terms of you know promoting their social the social skills and the interactional skills. And uh, with the incentive occupational therapist based in that center. We were to liaise, us, we, we used to liaise with the incentive uh, special need teachers uh, by giving them uh, basic therapeutic skills in terms of um, in terms of dealing with uh, an individual uh, problem. Uh, yes. So this is just a, a typical classroom. And uh, another thing we used to do, we used to uh, do a lot of trainings of the incentive occupational therapists and teachers, uh, just to just give them basic skills and equip them with knowledge, even if they are going to deal with uh, or to to help these beneficiaries of ours across the, the camp. So just basic training, annual trainings. Uh, we used to do like uh, every month, we used to have like one or two trainings for them just to build up their skills. So, so basically that is me. And don't mind my dressing code uh, because over there it's super hot. Sometimes it will be like 40 degrees Celsius and you can't wear if it's a suit. So you just wear in a simple uh, outfit. Uh. same um another thing i used to do i used to do a lot of skills demonstration and capacity building for the incentive occupational therapist over there and uh over here um we're just doing a demonstration for them huh? on how to handle a patient on how to position a patient uh how different reflexes present if they meet uh, a baby at an early age Yes, and uh, if you can check on the matter, uh, it's really hard. It's 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 not like a spongy therapy mat. It's very hard, and uh, that's how we used to survive over there. Uh, basically, he's just he's one of our incentive occupational therapists, uh, just demonstrating skills. And uh, I talked about community-based rehabilitation. So I used to do a lot of home visits for those children who cannot access the centers, be it due to the severity of their disability, uh, due to the distance, because uh, the houses are quite far apart from each other and the centers are also far so you you'll find out that most uh refugees will find it difficult in terms of you know reaching out to the centers and now i took the initiative of doing home visits and just helping them at home so that is one of our centers if you look at the pictures uh we have this type of a vehicle basically because uh there are no roads in kakuma refugee camp it's basically it has poor infrastructure. It's basically bushes all over. Uh, the roads are muddy. They are hilly. They have stones. So this is this form of transportation uh, is best for for such activities. I was talking about uh, the community. Uh, you can just have a glimpse. This is how. This is just a section of the refugee camp. As you can see, it's it's super dry. Super dry and the homesteads are kind of like uh, fenced using uh, kind of like bushes, not like an electric fence. Yes, 
this is like a community um, and uh, this specific picture uh, I decided to put it here because it really touched my heart because you will see the level of poverty first of all over here and the situation now so these are houses they are muddy they are, they are made of mud and as occupational therapist when i visit a home i will do an environmental assessment to see if i will do some adaptation just to favor our various beneficiaries suffering from different disabilities be it physical uh, be it visible or not visible no? and on your left uh, we have a case here of their siblings uh, they had cerebral palsy and uh, they had developed a lot of contractures and uh, pressure sores all over and if you can see the floor it's quite rough and you know when uh, the bony premises uh, prominence areas get in touch with the surfaces then it creates a lot of you know pressure sores and all that so what we did for them we kind of like adapted the place and uh, we adapted the place and we did a proper referral for them so that they can be helped and basically with the psychosocial officer we provided basic support counseling support just basic for them and just encourage the mother because um, the husband is also disabled and the children are also disabled so the mother is the only sole provider and if uh, UNHCR doesn't provide support for them in terms of food and all that they will basically like sleep hungry yes so I really wanted you guys to see such a uh, such a case so that you will see how we have very severe conditions in Kakuma refugee camp. Um, sorry to interrupt you, Mickey. We had a question in the chat, and um, Samuel is wondering when you train the incentive staff, are you cha training them in general? Um, or goal-oriented training tailored to individuals' ability and mental capacity? Um, we will do a, a group thing, uh, first of all, and then I will go to the centers like personally as the OT, and then I will do an individualized training according to their abilities and their capacity, uh, because I knew their strengths and their weaknesses. So it's more of an individualized training and like a group training. Yes, please. I hope I've, uh, I've answered. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move to the next slide. And uh, these are basic, these are this homestead. These are a pit latrine like a toilet for, for our beneficiaries. You know, when they come in into the, into the refugee camp, uh, they basically build, they basically build something like this, like a pit latrine like this, and just maybe with iron sheet structures and then just leave it like that. So for, as an occupational therapist, uh, I, I modified this, I advocated for modification of this toilet just to favor, you know, so that it can be disability friendly. Yes. So I just wanted to show you how their toilets are and with the, with the help of other organizations and referrals, like places like uh, Humanity and Inclusion, we will really collaborate with the uh, therapists who are there to just modify the environment to suit uh, our beneficiaries. So this is a typical toilet in Africa. So, yeah. And uh, we have an ongoing project over there. Uh, before I left the camp, 
uh, we had advocated for a sensory integration room because I had realized that uh, there were the number, there were high rise, high rise of numbers uh, who, which needed like, you know, sensory integration uh, intervention. So apparently this is like the only sensory integration in the entire Kakuma refugee camp. And I really feel proud when I see they're progressing very well. And I believe that our beneficiaries are going to, to benefit from such a facility and such a, a, a structure. So I was talking about inclusive education and uh, I decided to show you around uh, the various modification that I did, that we did in terms of uh, in terms of creating the ramps, if you can see creating the ramps and the rails to class for our beneficiaries who are using perhaps maybe wheelchair, they're wheelchair bound, they're using crutches and they cannot, you know, they cannot use the stairs. And also if you check down here uh, on your right, you will see we have taps and they are in a, in a levelized place where a wheelchair bound beneficiary will really be able to wash their hands and even like, you know, take water from there. Yes. So the, basically these are some of the modifications we did. And uh, Mark you, I was the first occupational therapist there. So just to begin this project, and so we haven't done much uh, as such in uh, in these centers of ours, but we believe in the near future we will, you know, expand and do much greater things. So my presentation was that brief and short, and I just wanted to share my experience on how life is over there in Kakuma refugee camp, and. Uh, Perhaps if you have any question, any comments, and if you check that picture, uh, we are very happy to serve the refugee camp, the, the refugees over there. We are very happy to impact life and also to offer occupational therapy services in Kakuma refugee camp. So thank you very much. And uh, that's it. Thank you, Mickey. That was fantastic. Um, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and take yourself off um, mute and ask. Um, Mickey, if you can unshare your screen, I'm going to bring up uh, Victor's presentation. Okay. So there is a question in the chat. It says, a question for Mickey, how does OT assist for depression and mental health cases? Okay, so um, remember I said we were working together with the psychosocial support officers and also we had counselors and other organizations. So we will really collaborate with uh, these specialities in terms of assessing and finding out how we can help, uh, you know, people suffering from depression and mental health issues. And we, we had activities going on in terms of uh, promoting their, their livelihood skills, giving them hope. That's why we were talking about the, the core values that were guiding our practice. So if you check all these core values, they basically also deal with their mental health uh, status. Yes. Well, that was great. Thank you. Anytime. All right, well, let's have Victor go ahead and start. And Victor, I'm not sure exactly what slide you were on. So if you want to just cue me, that would be great. I think we're here. Yeah, yeah, th yes. Uh, that's a, what, uh, sorry, members, I, 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 uh, my connection went off completely. Uh, so I won't put on my video because uh, uh, it's really dark. Uh, no problem. It is not your fault. We have all experienced this before, so no worries. Yeah. So it is. Uh, anyway, uh, 
when I continue from where I'd stopped, uh, briefly I'd mentioned that uh, we are in the, into the community and the settlement where we are working with the ultra poor uh, community members and also the refugees uh, who with uh, disabilities. And uh, these were some of the profile, what shows that someone is uh, ultra poor. Uh, if a person is found to be in any of these, and uh, this is especially for the host community uh, or in the community, if a person uh, goes through this criteria, then uh, that person, we consider them to be in the ultra poor. Uh, we can move on maybe. Yes, uh, we have a selection criteria uh, for people to qualify in, in the projects. And uh, these criteria, some of them are mandatory, some of them are inclusion criteria, and then uh, there are those which are exclusion criteria. Uh, for, for the exclusion, it's uh, when a person has got other NGOs within uh, the community or the settlement receiving the same service that maybe we may be giving to this person. Uh, and then uh, that person, we leave it, we leave the, uh, that person to that organization. We try to concentrate on the ones who are not receiving any other. And so uh, for the inclusion, we are looking at uh, a family or a household with prevalence of a disability, a household is dependent on income from a female uh, who is the main breadwinner. We look at uh, prevalence of child labor and or high dropout rate from school. Uh, such a family uh, qualifies. If a family has weak or no housing structure, uh, and then also if a household uh, lives below uh, 56 Point one three US dollars, uh, and then this person uh, as the total income. When we look at the assets or that the person has, let's say land or animals, among other things, the assets uh, that when we calculate all of them, and the person has less than fifty six, and then uh, this person is in the ultra poor, and they do qualify uh, in the inclusion criteria. Uh, let's move on. Yes, uh, in the targeting of uh, who has a disability and who doesn't have a disability, we are using the Washington uh, group of questionnaires uh, where we have six questions that uh, we do ask uh, if a person has a, dif a dif disability or no. We are trying not to look at uh, disability in terms of observation. Uh, if we do not ask, imagine a person has uh, a problem with hearing, uh, a person is deaf and you meet this person on the road, uh, you may not actually know that this person maybe has a problem somewhere, not until when there is this interaction. And so before we, we include the person into the program, uh, there is a criteria, uh, this Washington group of questionnaires that we do uh, for use for assessment and also a, a person uh, of course, someone may say, I don't have a disability, or someone may say, uh, but of course, we're working also hand in hand with the psychosocial workers uh, for psychosocial support. And uh, we do not want to uh, put what we think on someone if they do not uh, agree with uh, what we are saying. So it is uh, totally someone comes into the program willing after knowing the problem or difficulty that uh, they do have. Uh, let's move on. Uh, let's skip that, that slide. Oh my God. Yeah, so, so in the occupational therapy activities that uh, we are focusing on, uh, the main goal is uh, independence in activities of daily living. Uh, and uh, in this, we are looking at uh, training participants with skills to enhance performance uh, of activities of daily living, uh, such as self-care, participation, 
uh, household management techniques, adapting, uh, or I can say home and work adaptations to meet accessibility needs and improve uh, participation. And uh, for evidence-based uh, practice, we are using uh, mainly the CMOP or the Canadian mobile model of occupational performance. So uh, it is what we are using for uh, evidence-based practice in whatever that uh, we are doing. Let's move on. Uh, let's move on. I think I'd shared a different uh, presentation, but it's okay. So um, being an inclusive uh, program, we are also doing a, a livelihood. Uh, it's a livelihood uh, form of uh, an activity that we are implementing, meaning that, uh, like I said, if a person has left the settlement and is coming into the community or even when they are in the settlement and uh, they, 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 they are trying to reintegrate them into the community, there are certain activities that uh, they, are, they, they, they give them to do. And this depends on the choice of what the person wants. Um, uh, um, let me give an example. If uh, a person maybe wants goats, uh, they will be given goats. If, if, if they want pigs, they'll be given pigs or cows. They are given the cows and then they are taken through a series of training on how to take care of these animals, on what to do with them in case of they are sick and among others. So uh, it's an, uh, a, a livelihood activity that we are implementing with them. And uh, now our role is to see that when a person has gotten these uh, livelihood items, are they able to take care of them despite the disability that uh, they may be having? And so uh, we go ahead to assess their level of participation, their level of motivation, and also uh, their perspection, uh, perspective about what uh, they have uh, received. Let's move on, please. So, okay, I, I think uh, the, the, in the previous slide, there were some photos which we have missed, but it's okay. Uh, now, in uh, looking at uh, the uh, the activities that uh, they are doing, we look at uh, uh, their, their homesteads, their environments that they live in. Are these environments accessible? If they are not accessible, then we do some home and work adaptations for these people. Like if a person is a wheelchair user, what we do is... Uh, uh, we, we look at uh, the, 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 when we look at the photo on the on, on the left where we were still trying to do the work. Uh, you, you find that uh, the house has completely different design, and uh, if a person is a wheelchair user, it is not easy for them to enter and uh, get out of the house easily. And so, what we do is uh, we make uh, standard ramps for them, and also increase the door height and also change a, a little bit of the design to the entrance such that um, when a person is seated on the chair, uh, the, 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 the roof will not knock them. Uh, it is going to be secure. The door, we try to widen them such that uh, the wheelchairs uh, are able to uh, enter and also come out easily. So for accessibility, uh, we, we, we try to see what really we can do to make sure that the environments or the homes are easily accessible. Uh, we can move on. I'm not sure where I, the pictures aren't showing up. Uh, um, or is it possible we, we could uh, project the one that uh, I shared, uh, the, 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 the most previous one. Again, there is one more before this. Oh, before, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. One more, yeah. there is just one more. Uh, This is where they start. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So um, 
the, the, this is what we're, uh, the, the other thing that we are trying to, to, to look at. Uh, when a person has received, no, no, it's okay. We can start with that one. Yeah, they're there. So if a person has received the livelihoods, like uh, specifically for this case, this person received goods as the main asset. Uh, and then, um, but, but uh, when they are given, they are told to construct for them. And uh, she constructed the, this type of house. Uh, but my interest is in uh, when we look at the way she's using it, both in going in and also coming out, it is a bit challenging. And uh, this is a person with uh, 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 osteoarthritis. Uh, she has a really, really severe back pain. And uh, she's also having a deaf uh, 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 hearing impairment. And so with, with already an existing challenge of uh, uh, back pain, and, we, and if she's to continue using it like this, she has a lot of uh, experiences more pain uh, because of the mode of operation. So what we do uh, when we meet such, then we advise on an adaptation, which is in the next uh, two slides. Let's move. Yeah. Uh, to increase the door height, we can, next slide, please. Yes, such that, uh, oh, sorry, just one more, you just did that. Uh, such that if this person is to enter, uh, they are now able to enter without having to bend so low. And uh, in fact, after we did this adaptation, what came from her is uh, 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 the joy. We could really see her expressing joy and saying, I no longer feel the pain that I was feeling on my back. And, and so uh, we will really say, yeah, this is good because it has done something positive for her. And then uh, there are those ones uh, who have uh, the, the, the ramps when they are really long, but when we come around, we also advise on the modification of the ramps. Uh, these are to the goat house and also to the pig sty. And uh, if a person has pigs, and uh, but is a wheelchair user, the type of ramp that we are going to advise for that or to do is also different the way you see on the right and uh, on the left uh, respectively. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next, I think that one is done. Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, when we look at this uh, uh, person, uh, this is a person with uh, this, he got an accident about uh, 15 years ago and uh, he lived with it for some time. And uh, because of fear of uh, losing his leg, uh, when you look at the previous slide, how the leg was looking, it is not really looking good. But uh, we also do linkages because if we cannot do this in the community, we look at where can we refer this person to? So we had to refer him to the nearest uh, government referral hospital because those are the hospitals that do have uh, orthopedic surgeons and uh, also the services are a little cheap or they are free. So we advise them to go, uh, we referred him there and uh, after the assessment, uh, he got an amputation. So activities of daily living was much more challenging for him because of the nature of uh, the problem that he had. And so, we, we, after the amputation in the next slide, we see that uh, we, we, we provide him new assistive devices that he can use uh, in the next slide, uh, Dr. Kate. Uh, yes, we, we, we do train uh, usage of assistive devices, also provide exercises, uh, but most of these we look at the home-based exercises such that uh, they are able to participate uh, or continue doing even when we are not there. And uh, when you look at the photo on the right here, this is uh, a little person uh, with a caesarean uh, challenge that has persisted for two years. Uh, the pain is persistent and she also has back pain, uh, low back pain. And so uh, when we are looking at how we bathe in Africa, in most cases, you'll see that that basin, try to imagine that the basin is removed from 
that a small stool sort of and it's put down and this person has to bend really low to scoop that water and pour on themselves so in our intervention we looked at uh, a bathroom adaptation and we put that uh platform that looks like a stool there such that she can put her basin on top and then do the shower and uh, uh or, or do bathing and uh, much more easier without experiencing a lot of pain next slide Next slide, please. Uh, thank you so much. Now, this one is a 15-year-old child uh, with history of cerebral palsy. Uh, but in our intervention in making sure that uh, they are independent in uh, participating or performing activities of daily living without being so much dependent on the caretakers or the siblings or the parents, uh, we try to make modifications in the home and uh, this one is uh, a laundry platform where we put the chair, he sits on the chair and put the benzene on that little platform and uh, he is able to do his laundry. And uh, this same platform is also able to do his other activities that uh, he would want to do, but may be difficult because of the posture and because of the environment being unfriendly. So. Most of his activities, uh, we designed this platform and uh, he's able to perform most of them independently. If it's about writing, now he's able to put his book, pen and paper, and also try to write such that uh, it is much more easier. Uh, in fact, uh, for him yesterday is when uh, we got him uh, a wheelchair and uh, uh, we, we also encouraged the, 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 the caretakers that now that he has a better wheelchair, can he now go back to school and also maybe join other students uh, for, 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 for schooling? So we hope that uh, next week, uh, according to the parents, they promise that next week they will be going. And then our next intervention is to go to the school where he will be taken and uh, we do an assessment, accessibility assessment on how uh, his use of the school will be, especially that uh, he is a wheelchair user. We look at both the toilets and also the classrooms, uh, the entrances, among others. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is uh, a photo of uh, a pit latrine for a beneficiary with uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, she lives alone in the house. And uh, she uh, has this old toilet, which on our assessment, we found that it was very unfriendly. And uh, this case, we had to handle it as an emergency case. And how did we do that? The next slide, please. Yeah, so in, 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 in our intervention, handling it as an emergency to make sure that she does not fall into uh, the, the pit latrine, as you saw up there with the already rotten uh, uh, woods and, and, and looking really not in good condition. We try also to use what is readily available within the community, what is readily available within the, the settlement. And uh, for her case, uh, we, we got uh, the, 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 the pieces of wood uh, still from within. Uh, she's a person who sells uh, charcoal. And uh, when you look on the photo on the left, you'll see that there are some pieces of charcoal which are down there. And so, and she puts them in a container as she is selling. So what we do is uh, we got the, one of the containers, of course, requested from her, that can we use one of your containers to design for you uh, something? And that thing that we designed was like a commode seat uh, uh, that, 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 that she can sit on and then put the container just below. And um, after that, then she can take the container uh, for emptying in the pit because the aim was, we do not want you to continue using the pits because it is really old and uh, anything can happen if you continue using this. Uh, through psychosocial support, 
they are able to understand what we are explaining to them and also appreciate. And uh, among the reasons why we are trying to use what is readily available within the community is because uh, uh, for sustainability, if we are not around tomorrow, can they continue doing this once they have appreciated and also seen the importance and the use of the adaptation that we are making. And so uh, we, we made this very simple, but at least uh, it is of uh, much more importance. Now, the next thing that uh, we did for her was uh, to talk to the local leaders where she stays and uh, mobilize the community members for construction of a better pit latrine for her. And I remember each uh, community member was tasked to get about bricks and give her, and then uh, they uh, constructed a better pit latrine for, for her. Now she's using something better. Uh, this one is still uh, about bathing. Uh, if a person has difficulty bending, uh, we, we try to, to, to raise the platform up such that uh, the bathing is a bit more uh, easier for them to do. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Now, this one is uh, about laundry. Uh, for, for, for laundry, we also try to raise the platform uh, still, if a person is having uh, too much difficulty in, um, in, in bathing, sorry, in, in, in doing laundry, uh, this is a platform that we tried to do for her also. Uh, this can accommodate about two basins. And so, meaning that she doesn't have to over move here and there to where do I put this? So we make it a, bit, a little bit longer that it can accommodate her two basins when she's doing her laundry. All this uh, is to enable her participate more independently and also without experiencing a lot of pain when she is doing her uh, activities. Now, this is a person with a hip uh, dislocation. Uh, and so with that problem, because like I said in here, uh, in our local setting, people will get this benzene and put it down and then try to bend really low as they are doing uh, this laundry activity and so that increases or in, in, exerts more pressure on their uh, backs or on, on the hip that already has the challenge but with this she's able to stand uh, upright maintain an upright posture and then do her activities with much more ease next slide please Ah, thank you so much. Now, this one is, uh, a, a, I believe I'm almost getting done about in about three minutes. Uh, this is a modification for a toilet, sorry, a pit latrine. Um, when you, a chance to maybe come to Africa or Uganda, you'll find that uh, most of uh, us do use uh, pit latrines for toileting. Now, this is a modification that we did for a person with a spinal cord injury and uh, she's having paraplegia of uh, the lower limbs. And so because of that, she's unable to squat on the pit latrine uh, uh, independently. But also uh, noting that uh, in the same homestead, there are about seven to 10 people using the same pit latrine. So meaning that uh, the way we found her, she could come on the pit latrine and just sit on it directly. Uh, with her hands down and sitting on the pit. And so toileting was a bit challenging. And also when you look at the hygiene is also a bit challenging. So what we did is uh, to design this sort of a wood, uh, but uh, a bit more shorter than uh, these modern commode seats. Uh, we, shall, we, we have a photo for, for the modern ones that we are also giving out. But for her, because uh, of the reason that we couldn't get something really low, that can accommodate her use of the pit latrine. We made this. When she's not using it, she just extends it uh, behind such that other people, when they come, they, they can use the, the, the latrine with much more ease. And then, but when she comes, she can put it and then just sit on it. Uh, this is to improve hygiene and also to enable her to do 
uh, toileting a little bit more easier uh, without uh, a lot of uh, uh, challenges. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please, Dr. Kate. Okay, this is the last slide. Uh, on the left, top left, we see the uh, uh, also a pit latrine, but now with the modern commode seats that are, are available in the markets. This is if a person is able, uh, 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 he has some strength and can 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 walk, can. can, uh, can uh, so they, 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 they can sit uh, more independently easily on this commode, which is not the case with the, with the previous one because the other one cannot lift herself up to sit on this commode because it is a bit high. So for those ones who can, this is the type of commode that we are giving. And then uh, the next top right, uh, top right is uh, a training for a person who had received the prothesis. Uh, this also, we, we also refer to him, like I said, we do networking and linkages with uh, other service providers within the community. And, and uh, he, he received the prosthesis. And um, um, now once they have received the prosthesis, what we do is to continue doing training for them such that uh, they learn it better. When you look at down uh, left, uh, the, the, the bottom down, uh, we see she, a person in the shop, uh, but uh, you will realize her hand uh, has a, 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 a challenge or a problem. And uh, previously, when we met with her, she's doing shop, but uh, she had the table uh, in front, uh, inside the, 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 the shop. And so the display and also the operation, uh, the hygiene wasn't that very good. So what we did was to construct for her the shelves uh, such that she's able to display uh, her items that she's selling on uh, a better uh, uh, platform and also to ease her use and also to attract customers. When, when people are passing, when someone sees something uh, more organized, uh, I think that one really plays also a good role. And then lastly, her laundry. Uh, we also still had the same idea for the laundry platform. And uh, she has rheumatoid arthritis as well, uh, but also uh, she has difficulty uh, doing laundry because of the difficulty, the challenge with the hand, uh, or sorry, or with the arm. Uh, and so with this platform that uh, we, we, we constructed for her, she's able to use it much more easily because she doesn't have to struggle so much. Uh, the one hand, the shorter arm helps to support uh, the, 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 the clothes maybe uh, to give her more support down. And then the other one can do the, uh, the washing. So uh, she finds it now much more easier to do her activities in laundry. In, uh, 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 we also adapted uh, her toilet the first time we did uh, was using a chair, a plastic chair, which, which we just cut uh, to make a commode. Uh, but later on, we provided her with uh, a better commode, the one up there. So uh, this is some of the activities that we are doing, but also most importantly to note, we look at sustainability. So in other words, we try to look at what is within uh, or what is readily available within the community. And then uh, also, uh, for sustainability, looking at which other service providers are within the community. Because uh, if uh, tomorrow they, they maybe go, uh, or, or uh, the, 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 um, we, we are maybe not there, they are able to access these services. So we do referral linkages with, uh, and we try to motivate them, especially for people with mental health difficulties. We, we really try to take them through uh, number one, as an occupational therapist, I will look at how is the environment that this person is living in? Is it safe? Uh, let me give an example of a person with epilepsy. Uh, uh, if they have the, <coughs> excuse me, if they have the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry, 
So if they have a hole which they just put anywhere in the environment, in the compound, or uh, the, the 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 cooking stoves uh, are just anywhere in the compound, so we try to take them through a session of <clears throat> environment safety to make sure that the environment is safe, even if uh, instance, instances of a relapse or seizures come, uh, the environment is a bit safe. And then we also train the caretakers on what to do when there is a, 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 a seizures, this, this person has gotten seizures. So we train recovery positioning among others, but also most importantly is to refer them to the nearest health facilities. And these ones, again, I will say, we try to look at the government facilities because remember, like I said, we are working with ultra poor people. And so before they achieve the graduation that our, we are aiming at, that uh, tomorrow when the person got five goats at the beginning, uh, tomorrow they will be having about 10 goats. So with this, uh, but before they achieve the 10 goats such that if in case of sickness, maybe they can sell one and buy uh, medication or go to the hospital, we try to look at what is there in the community that they can access easily. So the government facilities uh, are there. Uh, and so we refer them to those ones such that uh, they are put on medication, even people with HIV among other sicknesses. So we, we are doing a lot of referrals uh, for them to appreciate that when I'm sick, I don't need to be inside the house. Uh, I don't need to maybe, first of all, go for sorcery uh, or witchcraft, um, as things like that. But I need to first go to the hospital. And then uh, uh, when they appreciate that, we realize that they are, the cases of, uh, uh, of recovery are on a rise. Unless there is any question, I beg to submit. Thank you so much. I hope I was audible and also I hope the network didn't disappoint you guys. Thank you. That was great, Victor. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions? There are so many compliments um, to both of you in the chat. I hope that you'll take a minute to read those. Well, thank you so much.